think about your goodness, God, I am astounded. When I think about your love, oh God, I am amazed. You gave your Son to save us. You gave your Son to save us. Defeat. A glimpse of heaven and my darkness turns to light The miracle of the resurrection reveals new Your affection, God, I am astounded. Think about your zeal, oh God, I am amazed. You gave your son to save us. You gave your son to save us. Defeat. A glimpse of heaven and the darkness turns to light The miracle of the resurrection reveals new light Son of God, Liberator, you set the captive free. Son of God, the only Savior, who can change our destiny. Son of God, Liberator, you set the captive free. Son of God, the only Savior, who can change our destiny. Son of God, our only Savior, who can change our destiny. I was so unworthy, but you changed the narrative. The veil was torn, the earth was shaken, a death's defeat. A glimpse of heaven and the darkness turns to night. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Westbrook Online. We're so glad that you're joining us for worship again this Sunday. I hope that you'll sing along as we worship today.
So come let us worship our King Come let us bow at His feet He has done great things See what our Savior has done See how His love overcomes He has done great things He has done great things Oh hero of heaven You conquered the grave You free it, recapped it And break every chain Oh God, you have done great things We dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh, Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high. Oh, God, you have done great things. You've been faithful through every storm. You will be faithful forevermore. You have done great things. And I know you will do it again. For your promise is yes and amen. You will do great things. God, you do great things. Oh, hero of heaven, you conquered the grave. You free it, free captive, and break every chain. Oh, God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh, Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high. Oh, God, you have done great things. Oh God, you do great things. Hallelujah, God, above it all. Hallelujah, God, unshakable. Hallelujah, you have done great things. Hallelujah, God, above it all. Hallelujah. God, unshakable, hallelujah, you have done great things, you've done great things. Oh, hero of heaven, you conquered the grave, you free it, free captive, and break every chain. Oh, God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh, Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high. Oh, God, you have done great things. You have done great things. Oh, God, you do great things. My name is Hannah Simeon Cox and I am one of the pastors here at Westbrook. I'm so glad you're joining us online for worship this morning. For everyone gathering online now or watching later, please fill out an InTouch card. You can find the link to the online InTouch card on our website or in the YouTube chat box now. Here you can also let us know how we can be praying for you throughout the week. Here at Westbrook, we believe there are four markers of a healthy disciple, worship, practices, action, and connection. And everything we do here revolves around those four things. For the month of July, we are collecting school supplies for Irene King Elementary School in Romeoville. I recently spoke with April Vasek, the principal at Irene King, and she wanted me to extend thanks to Westbrook for continuing to serve the Irene King community. 
I would love if everyone at Westbrook helped us meet our goal of collecting and filling 100 backpacks for the students at Irene King. Items must be brought to the church by July 31st. For a full list of the school supplies needed, please visit our website, westbrook.church. Westbrook Students is off to an incredible start for the summer. Our 6th through 12th grade students just started to meet for connect groups on Sunday nights in person with modified social distancing guidelines. If you have a 6th through 12th grader at home, connect groups is a great place for them to get out of the house, connect with others, and learn about their growing faith with some trusted leaders. Westbrook students meets at 5.30 on Sunday nights. Please visit their social media pages for details on those social distancing guidelines, as well as any other weather-related or general updates. Finally, I want to give a brief update on our COVID-19 plans. I am excited to say that we are so close to re-entry. If you are subscribed to our e-news, you should have received a message this past week regarding our re-entry plans. If you have not yet seen those plans, please visit our website to see those plans and guidelines. Since March, we have been praying constantly through our decision making, and we have been doing our absolute best to consider health and safety guidelines for our community. As Pastor Mont stated a few weeks ago, when we, re when we re enter our Lily Cash facilities, it's going to look very different than what we're used to. We want to aptly prepare you for that, but we want you to share with us our eagerness to get back together. Again, the full details of our re entry plans can be found on our website, westbrook.church. These guidelines also include what to do if you are not yet comfortable with public gatherings. As always, pray with us as we eagerly anticipate our reunion, and thank you for giving us grace as we've navigated through such tricky circumstances. We're going to move into our time of offering. If you are new here, or if this is your first time worshiping with us, please feel no pressure to give. Thank you all for continuing to give faithfully, for helping us give our facilities some much needed repairs and upgrades. Your offering also helps us support individuals and families who have had an especially difficult time during this season. As you're able, please give online on our website or using the Church Center app. And if you would prefer to give in person, our offices are now open for you to do that, or you can place it in the drop box at our office doors. Let's pray over this offering. God, thank you so much for this offering. Thank you for allowing us to flourish and grow in ministry, even as we've been apart. Thank you for blessing us with ways to reach out to our community and serve the people who are hurting most right now. As we prepare to get together again, I pray that no matter the circumstances, we would keep our focus on you. Thank you for blessing this offering and for growing it in ways that we can hardly even imagine. Thank you for allowing us to be a part of ministry and serving our community through this. It's in your name that I pray, amen. Hold the reins on the sun and the moon Like horses driven by kings You cover the mountains, the valleys below With the breath of your mighty wings 
all treasures of wisdom and things to be known are hidden inside your hand and in this fortunate turn of events you ask me to be your friend you ask me to be your friend and you you are my first you are my last you are my future and my past and you you are my first you are my last you are my future Constellations are swimming inside the breath of your desire. Where could I run? Where could I hide from your heart's jealous fire? And all treasures of wisdom and things to be known are hidden inside your hand. In this fortunate turn of events, you ask me to be your friend. You ask me to be your friend. Yeah, you, you are my first, you are my last, you are my future. In my past, and you, you are my first, you are my last, you are my future. In my Happy July, folks. Uh, we're cruising into the summer. We are cruising into phase four. A question of the day is this, have you actually eaten inside a restaurant yet? That's kind of a weird feeling, huh? Wearing your mask uh, into the restaurant and, and to your table and, and so forth. Uh, well, whatever we have to do to be safe and smart, right? Well, I do have to say though, get all your jitters out right now because we hope to regather soon and uh, we hope to come together as a church and uh, we'd love for you to join us as soon as you are comfortable. 
Uh, we've got a plan put together that includes safety and social distancing, all the while as we worship together as a family, together and not apart. And I think we could all say that this has been quite the journey, it's been quite the process, everything has been different, has it not? And, and I've heard people, I've heard people long to get back uh, to where we once were. They talk about uh, that, and they talk a little bit about uh, the new normal as well. You've probably heard that phrase. Well, I've been trying to adopt a little bit different language in the midst of all this. I'm working on, thinking about, working on creating a better normal. A, a better normal. Yes, I, I too long for a sense of normalcy uh, for my life and for Westbrook, but, but I don't want to just accept a new normal. I want, I want to be better for the sake of Christ as we come through this. I, 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 I want to be better than I was on March the 15th. I want Westbrook to be better in so many ways than when we started worshiping uh, exclusively and completely online in March. I, I, I want a, a better normal. Does that make sense? And it's been incredible what the Lord has taught us through all of this, and, and I'm thrilled to see what he, he can do and what He will do through us as a church in the days to come. And, and without a doubt, we need and we want you to be a part of the better normal. You are a valued part of this church. Wherever you're joining us online right now, whether, the, whether you're in Arizona or Aurora, you're in Bolingbrook or Oak Brook, we want you to be a part of this better normal. So get engaged with us, uh, sign up to serve, sign up to, to give and be a faithful steward, uh, to minister, to bless, be a, be a part of, of what we're trying to do and engage with us. Be sure to, to share your faith and, and, and challenge people to join you at, at Westbrook. Don't, don't completely get out of the groove of attending Westbrook this summer because because it'll just be harder to, to, to get back in the groove when we do start meeting physically. And so join me in creating a, a better normal. Well, with that, what I'd like to do is jump into our minor prophet study today as we continue in this series entitled Good to Know. Uh, for the last bunch of weeks, if you've been with us, you know that we've been digging into these short little books in the Old Testament called the, the Minor Prophets. And, and what we've been seeing are the words of the prophets of God calling the people of that day uh, to be faithful to God no matter what is going on in their lives. Now, they're minor prophets, not because they're lesser in their importance, just shorter in length. And, and I think that you would agree with me that the messages of these books have been pretty apropos for uh, the day and age that we live in. Kind of crazy, right? I, I mean, crazy how a message to a group of people thousands of years ago can still be applied to us in the United States in 2020. Well, the same can be said about the book that I want us to look at today. Grab your Bibles, if you will, and I want you to flip over with me uh, to the book of Jonah. The book of Jonah. Most people who have spent any time in church uh, probably know the story of Jonah. What's interesting about this minor prophet, however, is, is that while most of the minor prophets tell the words of God, uh, of what God said to the people through the prophet, this book is really more about the actions and the attitudes of the prophet. I want you to find that book, the book of Jonah in the Old Testament. Let's, let, let's find that and, and, and take a moment, and, and I want to pray and then I want to dig a little deeper into this text. So find the book of Jonah, and then would you just join me in a word of prayer? Well, Father God, I, I thank you so much for another opportunity to get together, albeit digitally. And I thank you that we can take a moment and we can learn from your word. Uh, we, we sure do fill our minds with new sound bites and and social media nonsense. God, keep us focused each week on getting some good stuff from you and from your word, stuff that's good to know, because it can be good for us. 
And so I pray, God, for, for close attention to these words, a, a distraction-free worship time, and, and a focused heart that will allow us to truly take these words to heart. May that be our prayer as we start this message in your name. Amen. Amen. Well, have you ever found yourself watching and listening to, maybe even learning from someone who maybe wasn't the best example? Surely all of us have done that, especially as kids. Uh, parents, there, surely there are times when you see your, your, your child playing with or being influenced by another child, maybe a child that, that you don't fully comply with. What is it about the rebel-spirited child that is so attractive to others? What is it about the non-traditional kid that makes your kids want to hang around them? And, and is it so wrong for our children, being the perfect little saints that they are, to spend time with this other kind of child? Well, uh, this thought and this question affects us also as adults. What is it about the rebel spirited person that is, that is so attractive to so many people? Is it because they, they go against the flow of society and, and in many ways you want to do the same? Is it because they are unique and they're seemingly standing on the outside looking in rather than the inside looking out? Do we elevate rebels because they're brash and they're bold and they're unyielding? What can we learn from the person who always goes against the grain? We know rebels, don't we? We, we know rebels. I mean, in, in, in our history, Elvis Presley was a, a rebel. He, he sang and he swung his hips into America's hearts and he literally formulated and helped formulate American rock and roll music. There was Walt Disney, he was a rebel, the entertainment mogul who made a fortune just by making people happy and giving them a place to spend their money, lots and lots and lots of money. When you think of an American rebel, maybe you think of James Dean. James Dean had one of the most spectacularly brief careers of any screen star in just more than a year and in only three films, Dean became a widely admired screen personality, a personification of America, uh, the restless American youth in the mid-50s and the embodiment of one of his films, Rebel Without a Cause. Yes, often people re re rebel against society. They rebel against the status quo and even against God. But, but even when that happens, as we can see in the life of so many, when you place your heart and your soul and your hands into the, the, the life of Almighty God, He can use us no matter how rebellious, rebellious you have been. That's, that's how God worked in the lives of some Old Testament characters that we've studied around here before, Gideon and, and, and Deborah. And that's precisely the case when it comes to the Old Testament character, the man that I want us to look at today. You may know his story. It's, a, it's an out there story. Some, some folks, uh, some Bible folks think it's allegory, but I believe it's true. And, and I believe that we can learn some valuable lessons from it. It's a story about one of those kids that mothers wanted to keep their children away from, probably. Here's the story. Let me recap it. You've probably heard it before. God instructed this guy named Jonah, one of his prophets, to go preach against a particular city. The city was known for its paganism and its atrocities. Instead of going to the mission field that God suggested for him to go to, he hopped on a boat and tried to sail to the opposite end of the known world. Out in the middle of the Mediterranean Sea, he was dumped overboard when the sa sailors figured out that he was running from God. A whale came along and swallowed him and three days later vomited him out on the shore. And so this time he obeyed God. He headed back to Nineveh in a world you, word you could describe him as a rebel. Study the whole book, right? A, a person who seemed disobedient and unteachable. But listen, a person whom God caught and taught some great lessons to. For just a few moments this morning, I, I want us to open up our Bibles to the Old Testament book of Jonah, and, and I want us to look at some lessons that we can learn from a biblical rebel 
as it relates to God's will in our modern world. So again, if you haven't found it, turn to the book of Jonah, past Psalms, uh, past Amos and Obadiah, you'll find Jonah. If you get to Micah or Nahum, you've gone too far. Keep your Bibles close all through this series. Memorize the books of the Bible. Many people know the story. If you're not familiar with it, I, I just paraphrased it a second ago. And yet, even with this short snippet, we can already begin to see some application. Maybe you're listening to this service today, and, and in a very similar fashion, you have rebelled against God. You may not be in the belly of a whale, but you're in deeper than you've ever been before. Let me tell you something. Listen to me. Listen to me. God can use you no matter who you are, no matter where you've been, no matter how far you've gone. God can use you. He can use you and me no matter how far we are from him. God can use you when, when you willingly and you knowingly disobey him. God can forgive you. God can heal you. God can use you when you surrender your heart to him. This amazing story can show us some lessons that we can learn and we can apply to our lives from, from, from one who seemed so unteachable and so disobedient. God used him in a mighty way. And so let's just look at some lessons as we go through this story. Here's the first lesson. Here's the first lesson. God expects obedience when he tells us something that he wants us to do, <laughs> Right? A glance at the first couple of verses of chapter 1, it says, The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai, Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness has come up before me. God said to this prophet named Jonah, Go to that city. I want you to go to that city. I want you to preach my word to them, for they are a rebellious and a pagan people. God told Jonah what he wanted done. There was no mistaking the message. Very clear, very concise, very understandable. Yet for whatever the reasons, Jonah was intent on disobeying him. Look at verse 3. Verse 3, he, he, he ran away from the Lord, he headed for Tarshish, the city of Tarshish. Now, from where Jonah was, Tarshish was on the other side of the known world. And Nineveh was to the east, Tarshish was as far to the west, the other direction that you could get at that time. And yet, no matter how far he tried to run, God still accepted, expected obedience. Isn't that what we want for our children? <laughs> right? When we ask them to do something, we want obedience. Not later, not tomorrow, but we want it right now. We want it today. We want it now. That's what God wants. And so here's a lesson. Here's something to think about. What might he be telling you to do? Is God calling you to greater faith in him? Is God calling you to greater commitment to him? Is God calling you uh, to more faithful obedience to him? Is he calling you to give his, your life to him? Is he calling you to be water baptized? Is God calling you to get involved in the church in a more tangible and stable way? Is, is he calling you to be more committed and more engaged? Whatever it is, lessons from a rebel, lessons from Jonah, listen and obey. God expects obedience when he tells us something that he wants us to do. Because number two, God will most definitely find you out. Look at verse 4 through verse 15. He will most definitely find you out. When I was a, a little, little guy, much, much younger, young, young, young man, I remember a story that I read probably in Sunday school one day, about some boys who decided that they wanted to go to a, te a, a movie, a show, that they knew that their parents would not approve of. And so they snuck out of the house one night and they got in the other boy's car and they drove to the theater across town on the other side of town. And as they were driving, one boy who was in the passenger seat, he got a paper bag out of his school bag, a paper sack out of his school bag, and he, he put it over his head. He had cut out little slits for the eyes and for his mouth and nose. The driver said, what in the world are you doing? And the other boy said, I don't want God to see me here, let alone anybody else who might know me. Now, I know that's a pretty silly and a crazy story, isn't it? But so many of us, so many of us try to hide 
things from God. We try to hide things from our families. And maybe we can fool our family and we can fool our friends for a time, but we can't fool God. In fact, read this story. Look and see what happened to to Jonah, verses four and following, right? I mean, you know the story. The ship was sailing. Jonah was down below in the berth. He was snoozing. A storm came, and all the sailors, they were trying to keep the ship from from, 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 tipping over, right? And they began to throw their cargo overboard to lighten the ship. And, And finally, the text says that they began praying to their gods, and they eventually then, they didn't know what else to do. They, they, they cast lots to see whose fault it was. And the lot fell to Jonah. They went down and woke him up. And you can read the text here. He, he told them that he was running from God. And he told them as soon as they threw him overboard, it would all be okay. They did that and the sea calmed. Listen, here's the point. You can fool some of the people some of the time, but you can't fool God. He will find you out. Here's the third one. God often allows situations or tragedies to affect us, to to cause us to think. Look at verse 17. Jonah got swallowed by a whale and and, and for three days he thought a lot about what happened to him. You you could say that he was a captive audience, right? Chapter two then shows us uh, Jonah's prayer inside the fish. I think I'd be praying too if I was stuck inside a fish, right? The sad part about all of this is that it took something so drastic for Jonah to realize what he was doing. And all too often, the same thing happens to us. God, God just might allow you to, 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 for, for something to come into your life to really get you thinking, to really get you praying. Lessons from this Old Testament book that we can apply to our lives. Let's move on. Here's the, here's the next one. God often gives us a second chance. He often gives us a second chance. Chapter three, uh, verse one, look at that. He often gives us a second chance. How many of you have ever received a second chance in life? Maybe a third chance or a tenth chance or a a 100th chance. Listen, that is God's specialty. All of us have. We, we, We probably didn't deserve it. Maybe we messed up again immediately, but we still got another shot. Our God is a God of second chances. Look at chapter three, verse one. It says, then the word of the Lord... Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time after he had been vomited up on to dry land. Uh, The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message that I give you. You see the second chance there? You see that? I mean, the guy has been in the belly of a, of a big fish for three days and, 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 and up he comes on the shore and God gives him a, a, another chance to obey him. As, as you can see, he obeyed. He, he grudgingly, unfortunately obeyed, but he still obeyed. What about you and me? Has God given you a second chance to make it right? Have, have you been obedient? Have you gotten the message? I, I hope that we all get it before it's too late. For someday we won't have another chance. The Bible tells us, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27, listen to that scripture. It says, that verse says, just as man is destined to die once and after that face the judgment. Now that verse does not say that man is destined to die and then God's going to give him a good talking to and give him another chance. No, we've got the second chance now. We've got the third chance now. We need to prepare for that today. Here's the next lesson. God oftentimes accomplishes his will even when our motives are wrong. Look at chapter four, verses one through five. Jonah had a, Jonah had a second chance. He, he obeyed God, but believe it or not, he, he, he obeyed grudgingly. Just like I said, he was afraid that the people would listen to him, and, and, and they did. Chapter 3 relates to us that the Ninevites believed, and they declared a fast, and, and all of them, from the greatest to the least, repented of their sins, and they made the decision to follow God. And though Jonah did what God asked, the people responded uh, the way that they should, yet Jonah was ticked off. 
He wanted them to be destroyed. Can you see it there? God, God can truly use us and, and accomplish his will in spite of us. Many times we do things not with the purest of motives. We, we say that we will help uh, one, someone wondering all the while what we can get back. But even if our motives are wrong, God can still use you. He can still use me. But, but before we, we finish today, there, there's one more colossal lesson that I, I see in this story. And I, and I think it's huge in light of all the divisive rhetoric that we are seeing and, and hearing these days. I, I think the point of the story and the point of the book is this. You and I, we need to be okay with God loving your enemies. Let me say it again for you to ponder. You need to be okay with God loving your enemies. I, I think it's clear. Again, read the very brief book. It's four, four chapters. Jonah really didn't like the Ninevites. Remember I, I said that the minor prophets are, 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 are God's words to people. The, this particular minor prophet is, is less, however, about God's words and challenge and of change for the people through the prophet and more about the actions and the attitudes of this prophet. It, it's obvious that he could have cared less what happened to the Ninevites. From the very beginning of the story, it's clear that Jonah wished demise and judgment on the very people that God wanted to save. It's, it's clear uh, that Jonah, in his extreme selfishness, was intent on not only disobeying God, but removing himself as far away from these people as he possibly could. He tried to run in the opposite direction. And then the story goes on to tell us that they, he told them to throw him overboard, which might have been the most selfish thing that he could have done. And yes, he, Jonah prayed to God in, in chapter 2, which if you read chapter two, watch for this, he never technically repented. Rather, he thanked God for not abandoning him and he told God that he would obey him no matter what. But even after being spit out on the shore and told to go preach to the city of Nineveh, what did he do? He resentfully walked into town and he only preached a five word sermon. Nineveh was a huge city in it, and it should have taken him days to walk uh, the city and, and preach God's word. But he walked into town and he said, 40 more days and Nineveh will be overturned. It's actually five words in the original Hebrew, but it only took five words one time. And the city started to change and, and they repented and they turned from God, to God from their pagan ways to God. And from there, Jonah walked out of the city and he began to pout. He began to bull, as my dad would say. He was selfish and he hated these people. They were his enemies and he wanted nothing but termination for them. And he knew that God was compassionate and he pouted some more until God finally said, listen, you may hate these people and, 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 and they may be uh, turned away from me and, and, and they may be enemies to you and me, but I still love them and I want to give them hope and salvation. And no matter what you think, you're gonna have to learn to be okay with me loving your enemies even if you don't. And God does. And so let me ask you as we close, where are you in all of this? Are you listening to the message of the Lord for your life by listening to his word? Are you obeying him and his desires for your life or are you going your own way and rebelling against the direction of godliness in your life? Are you a rebel? Maybe today you've, you've hit bottom. Maybe you've been swallowed up by the things of this world and, and the bigness of your problems. Has God given you a second chance? Are, are you taking advantage of, of this new opportunity? Listen, no matter who you are and where you've been and what your motives have been and how far you've gone, no matter where you are, God can use you. God can use you. He can take you from where you are and he can put you where he wants you to be. 
we just have to be willing to go where he says to go and do what he says to do, even if it's to your enemies. And that can be awkward and that can be frustrating, but God calls us to be obedient to him. You see, Jesus is waiting patiently for you. And if you haven't accepted him yet, Maybe today can be a day of salvation for you, where you yield your life to Christ, where you say, you know what, I'm, I'm done doing it my own way, going my own direction, today's the day. Maybe today's the day where you can say, you know what, I'm gonna be really committed and faithful. I'm gonna get in the game of ministry. I'm gonna let God use me in an incredible way. Incredible lessons from a rebel. Now, as we prepare to close this service today, would, would you go and grab your communion elements? Hopefully you've already prepared them for this moment. And as you ponder uh, this message that I've just shared, maybe we take a few moments of quiet time to not only to ponder the message, but I also want you to ponder what God has done for you. I want you to think back in your life to, to how many second chances or third chances or 10th chances or 100th chances that he's given you in your life. Remember in this moment, this communion moment, he, he, he gave his body, he gave his life so that we could have hope. And I pray today that as you take a moment and you take that piece of bread and you eat that piece of bread that you will remember that his body was sacrificed that you might have those chances. And as you take that cup of juice and you drink that juice, you remember that his blood was poured out so that we might have the atonement and the forgiveness of sins. And like through the gruff and the selfish Jonah, God saved the Ninevites. And through the gracious and loving act of Jesus, God saved us. Would you bow your heads again and let's pray. Father, your word is clear. Your desire for obedience is understandable. Your patience and your grace, and compassion is so appreciated. Yet even through all of your gifts and blessings, we often, so often fail you. May today be the day for all of us to, to break down the barriers and passionately follow, uh, follow you. If you can use a rebel like Jonah, you can use me. And so thank you for your love. Thank you for your patience. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for these emblems of communion which represent your body and blood, which has given us hope. And so God, I pray that you'll work us over this week and we can be faithful to you. In your name we pray, amen.
child of God I'm no longer a slave to fear I am a child of God I'm no longer a slave to fear I am a child
missing piece.